subsidizing science, universities, defense contractors, interstate road builders, etc. Presidential power grew with the growth of government and in some ways ran ahead of it, of course, because of all the national security apparatuses and so forth, ran, a, uh, ran ahead of the overall growth of government, perhaps. From the mid-1950s, the American right abandoned non-intervention and embraced the Cold War, asserting that they could run it better than liberals. They were more prone, after all, to blow things up. This was a better way to run the Cold War. Necessarily, the right gave up its earlier critique of presidential power. These shifts left the right with two problems. The first was the Goldwater bind. How to sustain an ambitious, expensive imperial foreign policy while having limited, relatively laissez-faire government at home? Could this be done? No. <laughs> the second problem was implied by the first. The right did not have its own doctrine of presidential power, but was reluctant to adopt that of the Cold War liberals for their doctrine entailed a living, flexible constitution. This was a trap because a constitution able to evolve toward presidential supremacy could also legitimate the welfare state, socialism, and all sorts of things that the right did not wish to legitimate. Unlike Cold War liberals then, who could embrace big government at home and abroad, the right wished to expand the warfare state with no end in sight while curtailing the welfare state. Meanwhile, Dwight Eisenhower, ruled by stealth, exercising presidential power without appearing to do so. Uh, his main contribution was to perhaps to uh, an expanded notion and use of executive privilege. And there's a context to this. Uh, what senator does anyone suppose was causing the most trouble asking for executive materials at the beginning of the Eisenhower administration? Yeah. Who? Yeah. Joe McCarthy. Now, this is unfortunate in the sense that uh, this tended to discredit uh, for a long time the uh, notion of congressional investigations and the president was treated as a hero for refusing to comply with congressional requests for papers, materials, things that Congress does in fact have a constitutional right, I think, to see. So it's part of the politics of the period and an unfortunate byproduct of the whole McCarthy episode. In fact, the Cold War liberals are always writing about Joe McCarthy is weakening executive power. What a terrible thing. Well, he had his faults, but I wouldn't count this as one. Uh, now, we'll fast forward past uh, JFK and LBJ. We've heard quite a bit about them. And as for Nixon, we'll just mention that he imploded, but the office survived quite well. In fact, the mantra, I think this was August of uh, 1974 that he resigned. I remember the mantra everywhere. I, it, you couldn't escape it. Everyone said, well, the system works. Oh, great. We have another president. The system works. Uh, you know, I, 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 we were so, so relieved. Okay, well, you know, we still have the bloated presidency. We just have Gerald Ford in there, which was not such, so bad. Now, under Ronald Reagan, the so-called real right approach power. But the right's old dilemma was not addressed. The Reaganites restated the Goldwater bind in a harmless form. Now it read, can we have an ambitious, expensive, imperial foreign policy while talking about limited government, <laughs> laissez-faire, etc.? And, <laughs> and now the answer was yes, they could talk. <clears throat> now some did more than talk, however. They found their long-awaited theory which we now know as the unitary executive theory. Frustrated by congressional interference, so-called, with federal bureaucracies and needing to rationalize violations of the War Powers Act of 1973, lawyers in the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel cobbled the theory together in the late 70s and 1980s. An early statement of the theory is found in the minority report on the Iran-Contra scandal. Richard Cheney was there. Now, once launched, the theory inspired presidents from Reagan to Bush II. But the theory really arrived under Bush II as the ultimate constitutional card trick, where it now justifies designation of unlawful enemy combatants, suspensions of habeas corpus, torture, universal surveillance, and much else. Now, as I've noted, the doctrine partly arose in the context of a struggle for control of the so-called fourth or headless branch of government. That is, those many agencies set up by Congress to study economic and social questions and address them via administrative law. 
Fitting these agencies into the threefold constitutional structure has been a legal theoretical headache. They may in fact be illegitimate in that structure. Elegant solutions may be wanting. Whether these and other bureaucracies inherently seek to expand their jurisdiction, however, may be left for empirical study. I'm not, frankly, as afraid of the Department of Agriculture as I am of, of another department. So it is enough to say that where agencies exist, the president seeks to control and corral them into his orbit. And thus we know the American presidency is an expansionist institution. Now, the unitary executive theory got its name in a famous Law Review article in 1992, and has cluttered up the legal reviews ever since. Legal writers skilled at interrogating an 18th century document and getting information out of it have added to the theory. I might, a few names come to mind, uh, John Yu, uh, Roger Delahunty, uh, Mr. Bybee, Gonzalez, I uh, probably ought to utter the words Federalist Society, and Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, while we're on this um, point, proclaiming themselves to be originalists, executive Unitarians offer slick construction and some very original understandings. And John Yu has produced the fullest statements, perhaps, of this ideology in it. The American president is godlike, sovereign in his sphere, and the sole judge of his own powers. But Yu himself, uh, perhaps has gotten too much of the blame. He is a symptom and not the cause. And here a little background may be useful. In the 1960s and 70s, the activist liberal Supreme Court provoked a reaction towards strict constitutional construction. Now, in 2007, we can see how apologists for executive power hijacked that reaction. In their hands, so-called originalism emphasized and practiced presidential power, especially war power, as the antidote to domestic unrest and reform. But strict construction and Cold War militarism could only be reconciled at the expense of constitutional concepts. The circle could not be squared, but it could be pentagoned. <laughs> now, and, and even worse, instead of the liberal judges' emanations and penumbras, unitary executive theorists managed to find outright psychoses in the Constitution. Which I, we'll come to these. And now for the theory itself, or what I like to call the seven or so seals of the unitary executive. Well, why is it unitary to begin with? Well, this uh, simply begins with the innocent sense of the word, simply meaning that there is a single executive with alleged virtues of energy, speed, secrecy, and decisiveness arising from the fact that it's not three executives or seven or some kind of Swiss committee and so on. But the unitary executive theorists quickly bring in a presidential claim to every power or function ever called executive by any ancient Roman, by Machiavelli, John Locke, Montesquieu, or Blackstone. So suddenly anything that anyone's ever called an executive power or function is in the American presidency just because that word is there. And I answer that Machiavelli, ancient Romans, Locke, Montesquieu, Blackstone, and others were not at the Constitutional Convention, nor did they help ratify the document. So this uh, is somewhat dubious uh, philosophical founding material. Now, according to unitary executive theory, the president has a general grant, which I was just talking about, of undefined power rather than specific tasks. Congress and the courts may not hamper the executive in the exercise of his exclusive powers, for that would be unconstitutional. Acting in his Hermetically sealed and separate realm, the president is beyond or above the law as made by Congress and interpreted by courts. Thus, unitary executive theory is not a statement of the law, it is an ideology of power. And we must therefore view it as a series of ideological moves. From control of foreign affairs and commanding and chiefing, the president goes on to initiation of wars, to the use of war powers at home and abroad, to the use of the laws of war abroad and then at home, and finally, to a right to alter any rule he just made under all of the foregoing claims and powers when he finds that a new ruling is better. Policy and execution replace law, and presidential power becomes as vague and broad conceptually as military necessity. 